while we're getting set up, I'll take the opportunity to, to introduce our next speaker. This is Professor of Medicine Bjorn Nolman. He is the Principal Investigator of the EC Coupling and Arrhythmia Lab at Vanderbilt University. Originally coming from Georgetown University, he has built a world-renowned laboratory uh, which focuses on using mouse and human models to discover new mechanisms and treatments for heart rhythm disorders. It's always a pleasure to have you here in Munich, Bjorn. Thank you very much for agreeing to present today. And we look forward to your talk on combining high throughput methods and deep learning as well using various instruments. Hopefully we can get that presentation working and we'll be up and away. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for uh, your invitation to speak. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come to Munich. Uh, a lot of friends here. It's a great time. And I think the purpose of my talk to put a little bit of perspective, because we had the previous talk that was uh, exuberance about the patch liner and falling in love with the patch liner. For us, unfortunately, has been a little bit of falling out of love with the cardiac site uh, system, where we were very enthusiastic early on. And I'll, I'll introduce you to that. And then we're uh, discovering... Uh, um, uh, more more problems with it and we're, it was really not uh, serving the purpose we purchased it for and uh, uh, we'll present to you some ideas on on how to uh, move forward with the instrument so with that um, as uh, was pointed out my lab um, what my group actually studies uh, ion channel diseases arrhythmias from the bedside to the uh, to the bench, uh, we have a arrhythmia clinic. I have cardi cardiologists in the groups. We do quite a bit of uh, a drug development. We see uh, patients come in with uh, arrhythmia disorders, with uh, mutations, and trying to figure out what to do um, with the patient and potentially get some personalized drug therapy. So that's the big picture. Uh, five years ago, or maybe more, um, we were one of the first labs in the US uh, to get the uh, cardiac site for uh, what we hope to do high throughput uh, phenotyping of IPS models. Um, because my lab has been uh, at the forefront of using uh, IPS uh, derived cardiomyocytes to model human heart disease. And I'm not going to go in, in big detail here. I'm simply going to give you a, a quick snapshot of um, uh, what we intended the cardiac site to use for. That is uh, one aspect is to deciphering ion channel variant pathogenicity in the human IPS model. Why is that important? A big question and getting bigger and bigger because uh, uh, every patient coming in is now being sequenced uh, is a discovery of uh, uh, a genetic variance of unknown significance. And it's been termed the genetic purgatory where the uh, place where the genetic test ordering physician, patients and families are stuck when a variant of unknown significance is, is reported. And in, in, in my group, we thought about using uh, the IPS system as an exit out of this purgatory. And so this is an example of a case in, uh, from the clinic where a uh, calcium, l type calcium channel variant uh, was reported in a kindred with long QT syndrome. Um, so, and you see the, the, the clinical timeline here, this is over uh, a period of, 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 of 20 years when initially patient presented with a long QT syndrome, index patient, you know, the whole family, um, initial genetic testing didn't find anything. And then a repeat testing 20, uh, almost 15 years later, uh, a variant in, in the uh, uh, LTAP calcium channel was identified, the N639T mutation. So that's a variant that uh, introduces a, a, a three in it. Now, this is not a typical site. It's um, uh, a lot of the um, uh, uh, modeling and simulation suggests that it's probably not pathogenic, but it wasn't clear. Um, on, the, on the other hand, it induces a, a potentially new phosphorylation site, which could have a major effect on, on channel gating. So having the APS technology in the lab, um, we decided to do a... Uh, patient-independent IPS model, which our group has used extensively to investigate the uh, pathogenicity, the, the consequence of a, a missense mutation on in a, in, a, in, a, in a myocyte system. So not in a hex cell, but in a, in a myocyte system where you have a full set of uh, ion channel 
uh, and uh, cardiac contractile proteins and calcium handling. Um, Lily Wong, she's in, in my lab, does a lot of the, the CRISPRing, and she can generate an IPS model with uh, uh, by CRISPRing and appoint mutation within um, well, probably six, six about six weeks. And the idea is then to, to have uh, from the control line uh, I said, uh, uh, make make our our line. It makes good myocytes. Uh, engineer the mutation in, and then we have isogenic controls because there's huge variability from from uh, line to line in terms of iPS cells. And so then we used uh, the uh, cardiac site, and uh, we have developed and optimized our differentiation system. Played them in the cardiac site, uh, generated um, a, a three independent in independent lines here and uh, measured the action potential or the field potential duration. And initially we saw that uh, the beat interval, uh, that the, the FPD max was actually increased, slightly increased, but you see how large these error bars are. Yeah. Um, but it turns out that in the mutant lines, the, um, the uh, pacing rate was also a lot slower. And so because the action potential duration is very beat dependent, we then uh, used to try different uh, correction formulas for the human uh, QT, and after correcting for the different rates, uh, there really wasn't the phenocyte. So we were still stuck. We didn't know is this mutation pathogenic or not. Um, now, fortunately, we had access to the optical pacing lid for the uh, cardiac site, um, which uses a, a channel rhodopsin. Um, that's uh, doing the differentiation process is a transfect with AV1 that expresses the channel of adopsin. It's light sensitive. You have this uh, stimulating optical lit, and then you can pace the system. Um, and it not only uh, helps it to uh, 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 control the rate, but as you can see from the snatch snapshot from, from the cardiac side, um, if you have well differentiated cells, they don't really speed uh, spontaneously. So you get a much higher rate of response in usable wells. Now, this is an impedance record and the impedance record of the system works great. Um, just to illustrate how, uh, if you have uh, well um, mature, well differentiated myocytes, they are sometimes not speeding spontaneously by, by stimulating them with a pacer, you can uh, generate beating cardiomyocytes. And it also illustrates that the uh, uh, during spontaneous uh, beating, you have a, a kind of slurring of the upstroke. Now, once you uh, start the optical pacing, you, of course, you have a very sharp upstroke, a very defined uh, beginning of, of the electrical field to potential duration that allows then a much better definition of, of uh, uh, the beginning of the electrical depolarization. And in this slide, we're, I'm illustrating the effect here comparing um, the uh, uh, depolarization time between um, a spontaneously beating and a paste beating myocytes, which is shown here. By synchronizing the initiation of the action potential, you uh, uh, drastically reduce the depolarization time again and a sharp upstroke because you, you stimulate the whole plate simultaneously. Um, obviously, this is important for measuring the duration of the QT uh, field potential. We're not interested in studying uh, sodium channel function here. This is primarily they're looking at uh, potassium channel function or uh, calcium channel function that prolong the action potentials or shorten the action potentials. And or what we really wanted it to, to look then at drugs uh, to can either shorten the action potential in a disease line or looking at adverse effects of drugs that would uh, prolong the action potential. So once we did this with the optical uh, radiation, then and this is our three independent lines. It became absolutely crystal clear because now we didn't have to use correction methods yeah, that indeed the uh, extracellular ex field potential is prolonged in by this uh, point variant in the L-type calcium channel, which then we confirmed also by manual patch clamping and the prolongation is actually quite, uh, quite robust. Um, um, now, why is that the case? So here we did L-type calcium measure, uh, measurements, and uh, this is indeed the, uh, um, we use barium as a, as a charge carrier. So we're looking at the voltage dependent activation. So the current densities or the activation of the chain, channel was not altered, but what was dramatically altered was the um, inactivation of the, of the channel shown here, yeah, which is classic 
for long QT type eight, where you have a, a slowing of the voltage dependent inactivation. And with that, we could clearly uh, classify this in the MI side that is a pathogenic mutation um, and advise the patients accordingly that yes, uh, uh, you, you, whoever is the carrier is at risk um, and uh, they were actually wanted to take out the uh, uh, ICD or the, the fibrillator, and we had strongly advised it uh, against them. So, so here, this IPS line, and we in, in, indeed we actually generate these lines in half, in within a three uh, less than three months. We had this result. Um, now, having the optical pacing, we could also look into uh, what correction formula for spontaneously beating one. Could should consider, and this was a little side project. We we have have not published that. Um, we simply uh, paste different wells with which had uh, good EFPs at different rates, and then compared. Uh, and it clearly is a rate dependent uh, shortening in EFP, similar to the QT rate dependence uh, in the human heart, and then by comparing the three commonly used. Uh, rate correction formulas based on this data in this line, it suggests that um, the Friederica correction uh, method is probably the, the, the better one. Now, personally, I think they all are, are very uh, crude and probably shouldn't be used. My personal preference would be to, to work only on paste cells if you're truly interested in comparing the action potential duration or the extra field potential duration in IPS cells. So, so far, so good. Now, when I asked my uh, uh, people to use the cardiac side uh, not, uh, uh, for the testing drugs or IPS lines, people sort of start ducking uh, because it's, it's, uh, uh, you have to use a, a, a lot of cells. Um, not every plating really works. There's large well-to-well -well differences in the EFP waveform and making it very difficult to really analyze it. And the amount of time uh, you have to put in to analyze these uh, electrical waveforms, I'm not talking about the impedance waveform, which were great, you can automatically analyze. But if you're interested in an electrical phenotype, um, it, it, it turns out that the, 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 uh, there's a lot of practical issues to the point when I asked my um, postdoc to, to test uh, the uh, drugs that he discovered that rescue trafficking, which is uh, in an RQT2 uh, line, um, and, and using the cardiac side, he said, you know what, I'll rather patch the cells and uh, rather than spending a couple of weeks and then with the analysis. So, um, and it, I, 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 have, I have had experience with others, and so it works great for mechanical phenotypes. And we've done that, and I presented that at last year's meeting for, for our contractile phenotypes, uh, uh, for dilated cardiomyopathy, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There we use impedance measurement, which works great. But for EFP measurements, we have used it less and less. Um, I still think there is a need for a high throughput uh, EFP uh, uh, measurements for drug screening, for phenotyping. So how can we go about to make this work? And so here, this is work in progress, and I'm coming to you just uh, sharing with you the two directions that we have uh, taken. Um, uh, so one is to, to use deep learning approaches, AI approaches, to have uh, AI analyze our EFPs waveforms. Yeah? Because clearly, I cannot convince anybody in my lab to do it anymore. So I said, maybe the solution is to just give it over to the computer and hand it to the machine. Um, and then our other approach with uh, that we started here last year when I talked with Nielsen uh, is to, to let's just forget about the uh, uh, extracellular field potential, but rather measure the membrane potential directly optically using um, uh, voltage sensitive dyes and combine that uh, with a 96 well optical simulator. And I'm gonna present to you these two approaches and, and tell you where we are or where we're not yet. So, so the deep learning approaches to automatically analyze cardiac side 96 EFP waveforms. This is ongoing um, and it's a collaboration be, uh, between a uh, essentially a deep learning AI group in France 
And it's based on, on this work uh, where they made a major impacts in using these, or, uh, these algorithms, the neural networks, to analyze the human electrocardiograms. Um, and uh, for risk prediction of drug-induced arrhythmias and the diagnosis of lung QT syndrome. So they, they have these, uh, the, 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 all the algorithms in place yeah, how to, to analyze the QT. And so, and, and uh, our group had uh, collaborated with them and provided them a lot of our EKGs. This is uh, Joe Ali uh, Salem. He was actually spent, uh, spent some time in, in our lab. We published together and then Edie Prefit, he's the uh, AI computer specialist. Um, and so this is what they're uh, doing. And again, I'm not the, the person doing it. So uh, this is not machine learning, but rather using deep learning or a neural network where you essentially throw a lot of raw data and uh, have the, uh, them come up with algorithm to classify uh, abnormal or classify beats and then uh, look at them under different conditions. And so he has a grad student that's working on it. And this was the first uh, step they did. They, we gave him the raw data from the cardiac site. So they, they removed uh, the baseline drift and then they classified the beats uh, and had automated beat detection. Um, and you see that there's some, some misdetection, then they have an algorithm to throw out these outliers, and then they generate uh, uh, standard beats, uh, which is shown here. Again, there is large variability among the sweeps, and this is the bigger, biggest challenge right now because the variability of the EFP signals is actually much higher than the, the human QT, even though the human QT is also really variable. Um, and so we're, we're working with them to provide them experimentally uh, well-defined conditions and recordings to train the neural networks. And then the idea is to use the AI to discriminate EFP signals from different conditions. Yeah. So we're still right now in the learning phase and I was hoping to sh show you some more results, but uh, I'm getting these uh, by the end of this week because we're putting in a big grant. So uh, more more to come. Um, but in principle, I think it's, it's a good way to go. Um, was, is it, are we gonna be able to realize it? We will find out, um, but certainly, uh, the, the capability is there. Uh, we have the expertise to generate the training sets through the AI. Um, let's see where, where we're gonna get with that. Um, now, uh, the second option is all done in-house. And again, this is collaboration uh, with Nanyon, where the idea is to use optical action potential measurements, which are much, much easier to analyze because there's so much better defined the beginning and the end. Um, in 96 volt plates using the panoptic imaging platform. Um, and so for, for in order to make this work, we need three critical elements. We need a, a multi-wavelength 96 volt optical stimulator. Then we need a fast kinetic plate reader, which we, in this case, we're, we're using a panoptic imaging system and then come up with uh, compatible wavelengths where we can simultaneously use optical stimulation, as well as then optical membrane uh, potential measurements. So I'm gonna just walk you briefly through uh, the approach here. And we've been working on these uh, individually. Um, the first step was to get uh, an optical pacing lid and we uh, uh, purchased that from Nanyon um, in the earlier this year. And I think in, in December or January, we got the system. Um, and we got uh, uh, 96 fo um, photodiodes at uh, three different wavelengths, blue, yellow, and red. And they're actually being put on the panoptics, what's in the background. And so with that, we can pro provide uh, uh, 96 well optical pacing um, to IPS-derived cardiomyocytes. A brief word on the panoptic system. We are using, this is a, 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 a high throughput screening assay, uh, mainly using uh, for thallium flux for fluorescent, for fluorescent assays, uh, where you can um, have 10 different excitation wavelengths, five emission wavelengths. You can switch between wavelengths. The commercial software provides 30 Hertz continuous acquisition. 
um, this system was developed by a faculty member, Dave Weaver at, at Vanderbilt, and we can uh, essentially uh, uh, do custom uh, uh, and tune the exposition rate up to 100 hertz, which should be fine for, for action potential measurements. It provides automatic liquid handling and, and temperature control, so we can we truly have a high throughput uh, system here. Um, we've used this extensively um, to, to develop uh, uh, drug screening assays using thallium flux. Um, and uh, I mean, the big project was to do uh, look at drugs that rescue trafficking, so where we can look which traffics in HEK cells. And you know why this we developed this project? Because originally we had planned five years ago to this to this drug screening in IPS cells when we realized that we just don't have the throughput. And so uh, together with the postdoc, we basically went back to the bench, said, okay, we're going to do this in HEK cells. Um, then we can adopt uh, the thallium flux screen and we now actually have uh, uh, candidate drugs that can rescue tra trafficking and, and we're in a, in a big project there. And the final step is actually to test it in a bunch of IPS line to if and to what extent it rescues uh, IQT2. So, um, so we have that in place. Um, and then the final step is to come, come up with the best combination. So the channel of adoption, um, which we have, works great. Um, but excited by blue light, uh, we need to have a redshifted um, voltage sensor. Now, it just turns out uh, the um, uh, dianaps or these these red, they just are, they're not very sensitive and they're toxic to cells. Um, the genetically encoded voltage sensor are also not great um, and also not redshifted. So, so, we basically said, yeah, this could work, but um, we couldn't get our uh, um, redshifted voltage sensor uh, really to work in, in the cells. So I said, well, well, we'll do it the other way around. Yeah, we, we um, And this is why we got the optical pacing lit. We use our uh, flu volt, which is a uh, uh, yeah, uh, flow-based uh, uh, voltage sensor, which has great uh, uh, sensitivity and works like a charm in in spontaneously paced cells on the panoptics, and we got have the data for for about uh, five years now, and but we're missing the simulation part, and so so now we need to find crimson. Uh, we need to find a redshift this uh, uh, channel with Dobson, and I'm looking forward to hear from Niels this afternoon. Is he here yet? Uh, because when we looked over the properties, it looks like the the red uh, activated uh, channel with Dobson is are uh, the way to go. The problem is they're, they're, they they still have a little bit overlap on the on the, and especially this crimson sensor here on the in in the blue wavelength. So we'll see. We made uh, from with our simulation in, in uh, with our uh, excitation from our uh, voltage sensor of the flow the flow volt. We may get some activation there, but that would give sort of a, like a background prolongation. We should be able to handle it. And the other thing is that they are relatively slow. So I haven't. I have no shit data to show. I think this is the only data slide I have is where we essentially in principle were able to show that when we, is it beating? Yeah. So here we're using a flow-based uh, calcium fluorescent dye imaging from a single well and using our optical simulation lid and you can uh, beautifully record it, the sort of fluorescence uh, signal. So that's where we are. And um, I uh, um, can conclude Oopsie, the whole slide. <laughs> and the, the, the slide that's not there anymore is simply saying that, yes, um, I think the IPS platform is a good platform um, and uh, there are challenges, um, but hopefully there's more news to come in the future. And I'm, I'm looking forward to get some feedback here at the meeting from the group and any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bjorn, for that wonderful enlightening talk. That's really uh, <laughs> interesting as well and important to see that, that world of the deep learning aspect together with such high throughput data. So even though it's just first steps, it's still really, really great to see. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions from the audience to start with? Okay, then. 
Then from my side, I have a quick uh, couple questions actually. We'll go through them quick fire. First, first thing that you showed about the uh, EFP signals from your spontaneous and your pace cells, you talked about that difference in the upstroke and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And that got me thinking, do you pace these cells in culture continuously or are you only pacing them for your measurements uh, to get them <laughs> adequate? Yeah, that, that's a... <laughs> Um, for the people in the IPS field, yeah, there is this idea of continuously stimulating to mature the cells. Um, uh, for for our purpose, we only pace them uh, for our measurements. Yeah, but we but having the the optic stimulation lid, uh, and we made the cable so that we can actually uh, put them in our uh, culture room and look at the effects of uh, chronic stimulation on maturation. One of the projects, which is certainly in the back burner, but not done. Yeah, um, we've uh, developed this uh, 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 um, T three plus Dex maturation method, and so our cells are actually pretty. And that's why half the well sometimes are, in, if they're really good to differentiation, are quiescent yeah, because they do mature uh, uh, quite well, even without uh, continuous uh, pacing. Um, and, and we routinely use this. This is a work that we've done over the years to d develop T-tubules. And so we, we've spent a lot of time coming up with uh, making more mature myocytes. And these myocytes have really good IK1, have very little IF, and they put any beating rates is relatively slow. So, so um, and if anybody wants in the, in the break, talk about these different approaches, I'm happy to share our experiences there. But for the acute experiment, we, we only use them for to, to measure uh, the, the EFP, yes. Fair enough. Yeah, with such maturation tech already being used, that sounds pretty yeah. good to me. Cool. There's one. Um, good, good to know. So uh, we certainly have stimulated them on the uh, SOL for hours. So it probably will also depend on how much, um, what's your expression of your channel of adopts and how much light you have to put in. Um, so good, but then that's good to know so we don't, we're, we don't use that as a, as a uh, um, you know, maturation method. So there's certainly electrical stimulation doesn't work. Um, there's probably even more toxicity there. That actually leads me on to just one other quick question regarding the, the last slide that you showed about this dual uh, system where mm -hmm. you're using voltage sensitive dyes with a red shifted channel rhodopsin. Will you, how will you also counter the, the toxic uh, consequence of continuously stimulating for the fluoval, the blue light? Um, and then, of course, you're stimulating with the red. You don't need to worry about cytotoxicity. Yes, but again, these, as well. uh, I mean, the it takes uh, maybe 30 seconds. That's all you need uh, to, to record your, your action potential and you move on. Um, and so, hmm? yeah, yeah, exactly. So, also with the fluid volts inside, no. they can cause some toxic effects. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so flow volt. I mean, we've also used it. Uh, I mean, it's it it works actually really well, and that's the reason why we want to go in that route. It works. It's less toxic than than the uh, dye four, dye eight dyes, which are almost not usable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and it, it, the genetically encoded voltage sensor just not very bright um, and slow. And so, and plus, we already have uh, uh, introducing the channel redopsin. So now you have to have two different viruses, or a, anyway, that's there again, plenty of technical details. But so, so I think the approach combining a flow vault plus a redshift the channel redopsin is to me the uh, uh, probably most workable one. You still have that issue that you might actually get a little bit of. Uh, um, Channel with back uh, background channel of adoption uh, activation, but then again you look looking at different groups, so it should average each each out because you're comparing uh, all groups under the same conditions. If you're looking at drugs or 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 mutations, so absolutely good. great. Thanks. Thank you good discussion. For that wonderful talk. One more one more round of applause, please, for everyone. Thank you. Oh.
Okay, thank you very much, Yvonne. We're going to have a short physiological break of 10 minutes or so, or actually let's make that five, just so we're sticking within our time limit. Uh, so five minutes, that makes quarter to six. We'll meet back here uh, for our last two speakers. Thank you very much.